I want to start by thanking the library's Programming and Communications Committee. They're the wonderful team of people at the library who help to produce every single one of our talks, and we have several every semester, and they just do a dynamo job. So thank you so much, PCC. I also want to thank Kirsten. Is she here? Can you just raise your hand? Kirsten is our co-op student who helps to coordinate the series, and she's just doing an awesome job this semester. And our co-sponsors for this talk, the bookstore is a wonderful co-sponsor every time. They're just so great. As well as the Latino Latina Center, and Rebecca Vera is a representative from the center. And she actually proposed this idea, so thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, we're also filming today for YouTube and iTunes University. And um, we pr appreciate your feedback, so there are comment cards for the regulars who come you know the spiel, but if you can take a few moments to fill it out, it helps us for our future programming. And uh, the Meet the Author series, we are so proud of this series because we feel like this is what contribute, helps to contribute to intellectual dialogue on campus, and it brings together students, faculty, and staff to look at a lot of contem important contemporary issues. Today's author, Dr. Silvia Dominguez is an assistant professor of sociology at our very own Northeastern. She holds a PhD in sociology and social welfare policy from Boston University. And Silvia is involved in the Migration and Immigration Incorporation Workshop at Harvard. Hopefully you'll be able to talk a little bit about that. Silvia's new book, Getting Ahead, Social Mobility, Public Housing, and Immigrant Networks uh, just came out and she, it tells the story of local ba Boston-based Latina women um, who live in low-income housing and you're going to talk a little bit about their network and their mobility and so we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, because they're filming, um, I can't move too much, which is really sad for me because I like to move around. But um, I also feel like I'm getting a tan or something. But, um, <laughs> but I'll try to stay put, so uh, cope with me. So I may actually move too much. But anyways, um, I am really privileged to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm really thankful to all of you for coming. Um, I couldn't imagine this could be a situation like this. So I'm really super happy and thank you so much. I, I very much appreciate the fact that you put this together for me. Um, I want to start by <clears throat> talking a little bit about the research and how this came about because I think this is an important component to this book. I'm an ethnographer, which means uh, uh, I'm a qualitative methodologist and that means that I actually uh, go uh, and hang out with people and figure out what's going on with them. Uh, I talk to informants, I talk to uh, respondents, and I follow, the, I follow them for some time to try to figure out how they're uh, negotiating life. And this situation came about for me because I was an ethnographer with a national study <clears throat> on the consequences of welfare reform, which was uh, children, uh, families, and welfare reform. And um, as an ethnographer for them, I ended up uh, being introduced into these two neighborhoods East Boston and South Boston, and I was introduced to uh, Latin uh, immigrant women who were living in these two public housing developments in these two different neighborhoods. Um, what we were doing there was basically, and this is typical uh, ethnography, was that I introduced myself to women, I recruited them, uh, they had to have b children between the ages of two and four, and they had to be either on welfare, off of welfare, or eligible for welfare. That was the criteria at the time. Um, I started to follow women there, and the majority of them, I would say, were Puerto Rican, Dominican, Honduran, uh, Nicaraguan. Um, and the, uh, I started to follow them there, and uh, I would see them like once a month. I would have a semi-structured interview where um, a lot of the information was focused on a particular subject matter, but it allowed me to move away from that if the respondent wanted to go elsewhere with the information. It allowed to capture a lot of information. 
Um, and uh, I followed these women for about two and a half years altogether. Uh, I also did participant observation, meaning that I went to uh, welfare offices with them, sometimes to job interviews, um, also went to birthday parties, et cetera, et cetera. So, <laughs> so th this, you know, I ate a lot also. <laughs> um, most, uh, it, it's unbelievable how much uh, um, food becomes a, uh, a concept uh, when you're dealing with women, when you're dealing with mothers. So, um, so that was the, the, the research component. Once I started to be on the field, I realized that, you know, here in South Boston has a, a really, really antagonistic background in terms of race relations. Um, they really fought integration in every way possible. And, um, and here are these immigrant women living in this public housing development. And I thought, you know, this has got to be an interesting issue. Uh, I wasn't crazy about going into South Boston because I, am, I have lived around here for a long time and I know what South Boston was like. So for me, it was even an eye-opening experience to even go to this neighborhood and actually um, do this research. On the other hand, East Boston is a neighborhood that has uh, historically been a transitional neighborhood. It has welcomed tons of immigrants, one after the other. So here were Latin American immigrants moving into public housing. Uh, even though they were also court-ordered, integrated, they were going into a friendly neighborhood, you could say, uh, an immigrant-friendly neighborhood, versus the women being integrated into South Boston were going into an unfriendly neighborhood. So, and I started to see pretty quickly that the women in South Boston were doing better. And what I mean by that is that they were having access to opportunities to get ahead that were better than the women in East Boston. And that's what became the focus of my study. Why was, that, why was it that this unfriendly neighborhood was creating an environment that was allowing these immigrants to get ahead while this friendly environment was creating an environment that was not helping them to get ahead. So that was basically um, how uh, this whole research came about. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I realized uh, a number of things. Um, one is that um, the context matters terribly for immigrants. Uh, no matter, the neighborhood context is I extremely uh, important because whether or not uh, networks, the networks in that environment are helpful to the women and whether or not the people, the, the service providers in those neighborhoods are helpful, to, helpful or not makes a big difference. And this was part of uh, the story uh, about these women. But the big story about these women is the fact that most of them are getting ahead. Um, I don't know if you guys know what public housing developments look like. We are surrounded by them over here. <laughs> it's very easy to see what they look like. Um, I've seen some shots of uh, South Boston and, and East Boston public housing developments. And I mean, they're very bare looking places. Um, they're, they're not uh, pleasant places. In South Boston, Mary Ellen McCormick is the oldest public housing development in, Mass in the country. And it's a federal public housing development. So there, it, there is like, there, there are trees and things like that in their courtyard. So it's a little bit better, uh, but uh, Maverick Gardens in East Boston was really, really neglected. Um, since I did the study, that whole area has been converted through um, HOPE 6, which is a HUD policy that allows uh, very distressed public housing developments to be turned into new, um, into new mixed, mixed income types of communities. If you go to Maverick Square now, you see that there's these townhouses uh, where this public housing development used to be. Uh, so, so that, you could say that looks way better than it used to. Um, so what was interesting, one thing that I think was pretty interesting about what I found there was that for the majority of the immigrants, public housing wasn't necessarily uh, a home. And what I mean by that, they didn't expect to be in public housing for a long time. Most of them took it as a temporary stepping stone situation. And, and the way that I found out about it was really it was a component of their trajectories to get ahead. Uh, it allowed, uh, being in public housing allowed them to save, to pay uh, a reasonable, basically people in public housing have to pay 30% of their income for rent. So it's a, it's a capped rent. So they don't, they know what they're paying all the time. This allowed them to uh, take care of many things that they thought they needed to take care of in order to facilitate them getting ahead, including uh, buying homes in their countries of origin uh, so that they 
uh, could actually go back uh, at one point. So um, also, I saw uh, many of these women uh, moving out of public housing, and that was a, a particular issue that was of interest because we, we think of public housing, people living in public housing, as people remaining there for generations and being stagnated in poverty. And what I found in terms of immigrants is that that's not the case. It's not the case for them. Um, they are using public housing as a trajectory to get ahead. Um, so <clears throat> that basically that was the beginning. That was the, um, the, uh, how I got involved in this and where I went with this. Um, first, I want to, because this was an ethnography, it allows you to basically create a very a nuanced understanding of particular dynamics. So I'm going to focus on two stories that I want to read for you from the book that have to do with young girls getting pregnant. <laughs> and um, the reason I'm talking about this is because um, we think of young girls getting pregnant as being something extremely negative and uh, potentially um, leading women, young women, to stagnation and poverty. And what I found was that that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, so uh, part of the reason that I'm also going to uh, focus on this particular story is because um, I got an email uh, after the book came out from uh, a website that uh, tells you to go to page 99 of your book and tells you to um, and for some reason, there's some statistical significance to page 99 as being a, uh, a, a, a page in most books that leads to the entire book somehow, okay? Which I found kind of interesting. And, um, and since then, I've been stuck on this story as potentially telling a very good story. So, um, so basically, um, this is um, the way that the book is divided. Um, I present... Uh, a framework that I think it's a helpful framework to understand how women get ahead. And I think it's a framework that can be used uh, for any uh, low income population. If uh, these ingredients are there, uh, the likelihood is that uh, the people there can get ahead. Um, then I basically, I talk about the neighborhoods. And then the, after that, um, I, I spend uh, one chapter per woman. I chose one woman that exemplified what I wanted to talk about, a woman and her family. And um, the women in this, um, in this book were getting ahead um, through their own sense of agency, but also through, uh, by negotiating networks that were, some of them were for support and some of them were for leverage. Support networks are those networks that um, help you to get ahead, to, to do what you need to do every day. These are the people you call when you need a ride. These are the people that you call when you're going to be late. <laughs> These are the people that you call uh, for a small loan. Uh, these are the people you call when you break up with your boyfriend. These are, you know, I mean, these are the people we count on every day, right? Uh, on the other hand, leverage ties are um, people that open up opportunities for you. Uh, most of the research on low-income populations will tell you that there's very few leverage ties for people. And uh, what I was surprised was to the extent that these women had access to leverage. And this became a big component of their negotiation to get ahead. So um, one of the chapters is you know, women getting ahead through mostly support. Another one is uh, women getting ahead through mostly leverage. Uh, then women getting uh, ahead with very rich support and leverage. And then uh, women who had access to support and leverage but weren't getting ahead. And um, I'll talk about that in one minute. So this comes from the chapter on getting ahead through social support. And this chapter is focused on uh, Josefa, who was uh, an Afro-Honduran woman, a uh, mother of three, who um, was here with her husband, um, who she basically uh, hid for the first six months of our interactions because she didn't, she didn't uh, basically want him to be found for some time because he wasn't on the pu public housing lease. Um, 
But, you know, I found out about him kind of quickly afterwards. Uh, I saw him and everything else. It was hard to keep him from me. Uh, so he, he uh, quickly, he, I learned about him. She, uh, Josefa enjoyed uh, having family support from a sister that lived in the area, uh, but also family that were in, in, um, in New York. So she had quite a, a, a few members of the family. On top of that, she was able to form all kinds of networks with mostly first-generation uh, immigrant women in public housing to, uh, in order to facilitate her child-rearing and, and their child-rearing. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Josefa and, and her family. They were, uh, they're Afro-Latinos. And the reason that I want to talk about her is because Afro-Latinos, even though they're immigrants, they have a different experience than um, light-skinned Latinos. Um, so it was well into summer when Josefa mentioned that Elvira was pushing her and Rosario to allow her to go to the next Honduran party. Elvira was uh, 14 going on 15. She was the eldest uh, of this family network, you know, and what happened to her was very significant to the possibilities of the others. So they were very worried about Elvira. Okay, how's Elvira gonna go into adolescence? Okay, and Rosario is Josefa's sister. So it was well into summer when Josefa mentioned that Elvira was pushing her and Rosario to allow her to go to the next Honduran party. Quotation, she just spent an entire day dancing in the West Indian Festival last weekend. She came back with a Panamanian flag, end of the quote. Rosario, who was visiting, said proudly. Rosario and Josefa started to kid her about a Panamanian boy who was apparently interested in Elvira. I asked them if they had met him. Rosario said, quote, I asked him, are you interested in my daughter? <laughs> Elvira tried to change the subject, saying that it was too early to worry about this. <laughs> the girl is like, stop talking about this, you know? He's just a friend, Josefa added. We'll be watching out for Panamanian flags. <laughs> They all laughed and went back to talking about how much fun they were going to have at the Honduran party and how Elvira would have to wait to uh, be older to attend. Then Elvira, Elvira upped the ante, quotations. You know that I can get in. One just has to deal with the doorman. <laughs> Josefa and Rosario looked at each other and very rapidly stepped in to say, quotation marks, you had your chances last weekend, now it's ours, the adults. Elvira got the message that she had to stop thinking about the party, but Rosario and Josefa looked at each other, realizing that a new stage in Elvira's development was coming fast, and it was already a challenge. Uh, this family enjoyed Honduran parties incredibly, and the Honduran community apparently has some super parties. <laughs> I never got to go to any of them, which was kind of a bummer. Um, because Elvira is the eldest member of her generation, her family has at stake her passage into adulthood. Elvira can play the influential role in promoting upward assimilation or social mobility for her younger siblings and cousins. By February 2001, Elvira had been living with Josefa and her family for several months. Uh, Rosario was visiting, and I took the opportunity to ask her about her daughter. What ended up happening is that uh, Elvira um, was, uh, Rosario felt like it'd be better. Rosario was divorced, so she was, she was a single mother rearing the children, and she felt that um, it'd be better for Elvira if she was growing up, she, if she moved in with uh, uh, Josefa and her family, so that there would be more uh, control placed on her. So um, Rosario was visiting. She had been living there for several months at this point. So I asked them, you know, um, so how do you think Elvira is doing? Rosario said, she's a bit loose, <laughs> but her aunt has her under control. I said, any boyfriends? What happened to the Panamanian boy? <laughs> Rosario says, the Panamanian boy? He went back to Panama, she said with relief. She, she can't be dealing with boyfriends now that she needs to concentrate on school. I asked, are you worried about her? Rosario said, oh yes, she listened to her friends too much. They're not good friends, you know. They just have, they don't have her well-being at heart. They're young girls who are running around wanting Elvira to act the same way. They like boys too much. They're all chasing after boys. I asked, are Elvira's friends Honduran or what? I'm trying to get out, you know, so who are these friends? Um, then Josefa stepped in and said, the majority are uh, Honduran, 
but she also has African-American girlfriends. The other day, they came over the house asking to go to the movies, and I said no. And Bria had many chores to finish before anything. I told them to go on their way. She didn't like it, you know. What worries you the most, I asked. Josefa says, we don't know those families. They're friends from school. I said, would it be different if you know them, if you knew their family? Josefa said, it's the age they think they know everything. Rosario added, uh, parentheses, revealing how much she has thought about this. Maybe, because, you know, sometimes girls look like they're good girls and that they may come from families, but they may come with families with bad, bad roots. Uh, they're, they're, they may be good roots at home, but then they may see things outside the home and influence them to do things that are wrong. And then they want others to do the same so that they feel better about what they have done. <laughs> I keep telling her that she needs to pick up her friendships well because they're no friends, Sylvia. They're only acquaintances. They discussed this further and talked about Olvida's interest in music, dance, and modeling, about how those interests could be nurtured. They continued this discussion for a while, but it was clear that they had great concerns about Olvida. Um, the, the, it was clear that uh, the fact that they could not, they didn't know what happens in the school system is that children are exposed, particularly in the public school systems of Boston, to a variety of families that are not necessarily anybody that the parents know. Uh, so for them, if you think in terms of immigrants coming from tight communities uh, back home somewhere in their countries of origin, it's very disconcerting for them to see their kids having access to people just from a variety of places that, are, that they have absolutely no conception of how that may be for them. So, for the, they, you know, I, I noticed from them this sense of total lack of control over this and, and, and feeling like they cannot have any control over it. They're, they're going to school and they're having access to these people and they just don't know them. Okay, and this was very worrisome for them. Um, about a year later, um, um, when I came, when I was asking about her, I, I did a, a follow-up. I found out that Elvira had gotten pregnant. And this was a heavy-duty uh, shock for the family. They really were very upset that she had gotten pregnant. At the same time, uh, they were continuing to offer her support and wanted, uh, wanted her to continue to live with the family so that they could help her with the baby. Uh, for the most part, the Latin immigrants that I dealt with all had, uh, all took care of, of children in an extended family situation. So it was not uncommon for this to happen. Um, I don't know what ended up happening with, happening with Elvira. I have no idea if this re derailed her trajectory. I have no idea because I, uh, at that point I lost contact with her. But um, I wanted to talk about that story because I think this is uh, an issue that really uh, impacts uh, youth, uh, immigrant youth, in, in, uh, in, in, um, who, who are in, basically in public schools in a city like Boston. Um, because they're Afro-Honduran, and the uh, literature will tell you that the one way that Afro-Latinos or, or, or Afro, like say for example West Indian immigrants get ahead, is that they really re uh, show and reinforce their immigrant identity so that they spend a lot of time um, distancing themselves from African Americans in an effort to maintain uh, cultural distance away from them by really emphasizing their, their identity as immigrants. Um, they were trying to do that by having all these um, networks of family members who were all Honduran or uh, also Afro-Latinos, but they were all immigrants. And they were trying to do that by, um, by focusing on these things like Honduran parties and other family rituals that they really pursued. So they were, they, even though you know, the, the guerras never uh, really read anything about Afro-Latinos or how they maintain or how they get ahead and all that, they were doing the right things to try to uh, influence their offspring to really focus on their uh, immigrant identity. So it was very, it, it's not like they didn't do what they could do. But I think what happened uh, with Elvira is uh, that on one hand, you have, um, you're, you're basically, uh, the girl was being trained because she was the eldest girl. She did a lot of the work at home. She, you could say that she was being trained to be a homemaker. She was trained to be a mother, 
Okay, so we could say, you know, the family's training her to be, to be a parent in a way. But um, I would say that there's nothing wrong with her being trained to be a parent. Somebody has to parent children. Uh, I think the issue where we need to focus here is in just how difficult the school system is for immigrants. If she, if Elvira had had a competing interest, if school had become a competing interest for Elvira, Elvira may not have uh, maybe gotten pregnant. So this is something that, you know, um, I think we need to go beyond saying, okay, the family didn't do what they needed to do, or to go beyond uh, the individual girl as being um, prepared to be a homemaker, and more into thinking of how the school is not uh, offering an, op an option for girls, for particularly immigrant girls. So um, if we move from this story to um, the next story of young pregnancy, and then I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> um, this turned out to be Camila. I met Camila when she was about 17, 18. She was just graduating from high school. She's a second generation Dominican girl. She had uh, uh, been in South Boston since she was about five. So she had, had, she, had, she had been one of the early pioneers in South Boston. And she um, knew how um, much they weren't wanted in South Boston, just having grown up there. Um, okay. So in talking to Elvira, I mean to, I'm sorry, to Camila, and uh, like I said, I met her when she was about 18. She had a two-year-old daughter. So she had gotten pregnant when she was 16. And the reason that I want to bring her up is that um, she got pregnant at the same age as Elvira had gotten pregnant. So here she's talking about um, her, her situation in South Boston and how uh, she grew up among this really antagonistic environment. And she's talking about a race riot that occurred there. So she describes it like, it was like 150 people, mostly older guys that were involved. We all stayed inside the house. There was so much hatred. My parents didn't know what to say to us. It was so hard to explain things that are not right. How would I explain that to Miranda, her daughter? I would try and explain that not everyone thinks the same way as you do, and one has to learn to live with others who may not like you. One day they will just pay for what they're de doing. One needs to enjoy life and smile. They all they do not like to see you smile. This gets them more aggravated. Let them drown in their own frustration. <laughs> she, she just walked around smiling. <laughs> um, so I asked her, um, you know, I asked her what had been her, uh, how, you know, what had helped her basically to get ahead. And she talked about this relationship she had with this nun. And um, I would conceptualize this nun as a bridge. Bridge and social network literature are people who will connect dissimilar communities together. So this was an Irish American uh, nun who was a service provider who, uh, whose whole focus became how do I get these immigrants into the services in South Boston. That's a bridge, okay? Um, one of the dedicated bridges in South Boston was Sister Madalena who worked for a Catholic social service organization, and I helped Latin American, and that, that helped that Latin American families. Sister Magdalena, who appears in the lower, uh, we're not gonna see the diagram, so it doesn't matter. Um, when I first interviewed her and asked her about the experiences that led her to work with immigrants, she responded, I think that in the past I lived in South America, I developed a sense of how it felt to be an immigrant, and you know that I grew up in Charlestown, a neighborhood right in Boston, which was also Irish, uh, Irish American. So I know what these folks are like here in South Boston. I used to run a support group for wives of Southie men who are not from South Boston. This just tells you what the implications are for minorities here. I know that South Boston is a resource-rich neighborhood, and my job is to get Latinos to those resources. Do you imagine she used to run a support group for women that had married South Boston men? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that really speaks to um, the, the strong ethnic identity of South Boston residents, you know. Um, so 
As a bilingual and bicultural Catholic nun, Sister Madalena evoked tremendous res respect and trust in the growing Latin American community in public housing. This growth uh, was occurring in the context of forced integration and defendant neighborhood reaction. I mean, they were clearly a defendant neighborhood. The Irish American residents of South Boston have struggled against integration to defend their ethnic identity and ethnic neighborhood, and the neighborhood's exclusionary history prompts Sister Madalena and others to self-initiate this bridging type of uh, activity. Camilla often spoke about Sister Madalena when talking about her childhood experiences in South Boston. She explained how Sister Madalena got her involved in experiences that help her to develop into what I call a self-propelling uh, agent. <laughs> She was a highly efficacious, she had a highly efficacious sense of agency. This is Camila talking about her. She came into our house and let us know about Unity Day, Unity Day, you know, the celebration every summer. She also told us about programs to get toys for Christmas. Then she's the one that got me into the Young Entrepreneurs Club. It was a club that taught us to produce and market products. It was just me and my brother. All the rest were white kids. We learned to make jewelry and then took a trip to New York City and buy supplies. It was really awesome. Then I came back and sold the jewelry to area businesses. I learned so much on that trip. Sister Madalena also helped Camila and her brother get involved with a network for teaching, um, network for teaching entrepreneurship, an organization that provides entrepreneurship education to young people from low-income communities. This is an actual program that exists out there. Camila credits that program for presenting several opportunities and teaching her the, prop, the power of social relations. This is her saying again. It taught me to see how business takes place and how I could start something and make it happen all the way by getting the right information, you know? It's like people, knowing the right people. That is what helps us to get what we need to get done. It taught me that I can do what I set my mind to do. Um, now, Camila um, went back to school right away uh, after she uh, had her daughter. The father, this was a very traumatic situation for the family because uh, prior to this, Camila was being wooed by a modeling agency and they had taken pictures of her and everything and next thing you know, she's pregnant. And um, um, her family, be, you know, for many years, uh, every time that she would do something or she had a problem, they would say, well, you know, you brought this on yourself. They were very clear in telling her this was wrong <clears throat> and that she had done wrong and that she had to deal with the consequences at the same time that they gave her loads of support. So there was a, a they, she received this dual message all the time, which really allowed her to not only take responsibility, but also get ahead. She went back to school right away. She finished um, high school. She was working in uh, Au Bon Pain, and she was realizing that she was going nowhere there. <laughs> Very quickly, she, she uh, talked about feeling, uh, you know, like having a sense of alienation that they, she was just going to be there for a long time and get nowhere. So she uh, decided to, um, uh, her sister who was studying business uh, hooked her up with a friend who uh, gave her an opportunity at a financial institution. So she ended up uh, landing at a bank, which is in, actually in Coolidge Corner, um, as a cashier. Uh, as soon as she landed there, she started to take uh, business courses as a part of her benefit package. So um, in the next six years, Camila got her bachelor's in finance, uh, and she now is um, the manager of that particular branch. So she's 26, okay? So um, the reason I'm bringing these two girls up is that um, for Elvita, getting pregnant at 16 doesn't mean the end of the world if you consider somebody like Camila, okay? Uh, Camila uh, was the woman who most clearly showed uh, having support, a whole bunch of support networks and very, uh, very strong leverage networks within her family, within her boyfriend's family. Um, she had everything she needed you know, and she also had access to these bridges that really helped her out in terms of opening opportunities for her. So, um, you know, there is, there's no reason why having, basically what I'm saying is that there's no reason why having a baby at 16 has to be that, uh, the end or the stagnation of poverty. It's clear that uh, within immigrants, if they continue to be supportive of their, of their children, um, 
at the same time that they say, you know, you bought this on yourself. I mean, uh, Camila was forever telling me, yeah, they said that to me again. I mean, she, to, <laughs> she was clearly, um, in a way, antagonized by the fact that her parents kept this up. She would say, well, I graduated from school. Why don't they just lay off me a little? But, you know, um, within, after one year that she was in um, working at the branch, she moved out of public housing. And she's been living in a, a regular apartment in Boston now. She, she uh, has been with uh, her partner, who she's been with, who actually came into the picture when she was pregnant, has been with her since then. They've had a second child since then. And, um, and so here's a 26-year-old bank manager who grew up in South Boston public housing development um, and who's got two kids. So basically, you know, uh, these two stories, I think, and, and uh, allow you to see how ethnography can really give you a nuanced understanding of these dynamics uh, and how it is that uh, that doesn't become the end of possibilities for young women. So I'll stop there, um, and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, that's a great question because I didn't explain it. You're right. Um, basically, what happened is that um, the immigrants were all segregated and clustered in the public housing developments. So you had the activation of the service providers, who I call bridges, who who decided that they would help this or these this population. So uh, at the same time, and I think that this is a result of the amount of racism that occurred in this neighborhood. Um, the tenant task force, which is all public housing developments have tenant task forces, and what they do, they basically either, uh, they, they get funding, it depends on their level of professionalism how good they are. The one us in Maryland McCormick was excellent. I mean, they had uh, people with uh, MPHs who were, who were di directing it, who could get grants, who could offer more and more services. So it was a fully functioning uh, service agency and that made a big difference. So it was a combination of the fact that they were clustered in public housing and that, that, that there were these bridges that activated themselves to help them and the fact that there was a well-functioning tenant task force. In Maverick Garden, the problem that was happening there was that um, there were so many immigrants coming into Southeast Boston and the service delivery in East Boston, they, they knew the providers uh, were used to dealing with immigrants because they, the, the identity is one of a receiving neighborhood. But nevertheless, there were so many immigrants coming with so much need that they just didn't pay attention to the women in public housing. It was, it's a, it was a matter of need in the whole neighborhood that created a, a, a sense of vacuum away from the public housing development. Um, not only they didn't offer services to the public housing development, but um, the tenant task force in the Maverick uh, Gardens wasn't a viable tenant task force, so that there was no, the, none of the things that were helping in South Boston were helping in East Boston. And that was clearly a detrimental component. One thing that was, that's important is that um, domestic violence became the one and only reason why these women weren't getting ahead. Um, if they were victims of domestic violence or they had grown up with violence in their homes, um, that wasn't allowing them to get ahead. So um, it was very important that they get services. And uh, the women uh, that were in East Boston that had had, that were traumatized, weren't getting any services, while the women in South Boston that were traumatized had access to services. And that made a big, big difference. Some years ago, um, in South Boston, made it Michael McDonald. Yeah. Others were killed, yeah. Others were killed. And I know in South Boston and Charlestown, there's a very high rate of suicide among young people. I was among whites, among the Irish Americans, yeah. The Irish Americans, right. Yeah. And I was wondering if you saw any of that with the um, Dyson population. Um, no. 
No, I didn't see any of that. I think, I think, I think that the suicide, I mean, what, what Michael, uh, I mean, he was able to really give light to uh, the amount of uh, violence that was occurring in, in, in South Boston and drug use and all of that before they were ever integrated, right? Before they were integrated. And he then talks about what happened once uh, forced integration with uh, busing, a school busing happened. And I mean, it's a very good story. If anybody's interested in neighborhood dynamics and that kind of stuff, this story is very, is very interesting because um, um, there was like a, um, how can I say this? Um, the heyday for South Boston went down, you know? And in the process, the identity, the reinforced identity, the ethnic identity that was so rich there really stopped to be reinforced. And in the process, you ended up with, um, with youth who really, once the immigrants came in, uh, at the same time, another thing that occurred was that uh, gentrification was occurring in South Boston. So a lot of the uh, white residents, the Irish American residents, were moving out of uh, public housing but into the surrounding low income neighborhood. And those, uh, those stopped being low income. They, they, so they, they, be, they became a very trapped population without access to the outside. And I think part of this has a lot to do with their intake of uh, drugs, particularly heroin, and the fact that there was a lot of youth suicide. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I did see a lot of transnational. In every chapter, I have a, a section on transnational ties. Um, so uh, these women had transnational ties, and this was very important because we don't think of poor, low-income people having transnational ties either. Um, the um, transnational ties became uh, vital in Camila's situation when she was pregnant. She was actually back in the Dominican Republic with her aunt when she found out she was pregnant. And her aunt in the Dominican Republic brokered the situation with her family and really helped uh, for the family to understand the situation and to receive Camila in a, in a much more positive way than they would have if she hadn't been instrumental in making that connection. So for Camila, the transnational uh, tie was extremely important. Uh, it also allowed um, her and many of the other people um, Families regularly sent their children during the summertime back to their homes of origin to keep them out of uh, public housing in the, in, the, in the summertime and also to reinforce their uh, ethnic identity. So that was a clear uh, aspect to the transnationalism that was happening. Uh, transnational ties also helped uh, these women buy homes back home, and that was a vital uh, role they played. Um, and I could say, uh, in terms of like differences in transnationalism, um, because I had a small sample, I can't say too much about that. But I can tell you that if you came from a country that um, where you know one of my, one of the uh, respondents I have is an Afro Nicaraguan woman who is also a lesbian, she was never going to go back to Nicaragua. I, it was clear that you know her part of her being here was necessary because of her sexual orientation. So, you know, although transnational ties have been uh, vital for her to get out of Nicaragua, she was not going to use them uh, regularly. So um, there are conditions for particular immigrants that prevent them from using transnational ties that I think are there also. Um, there were also transnational ties, you could say, for Puerto Ricans, even though they're also they're American, but they're still um, keeping relationships with people back in, 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 in Puerto
Puerto Rico. And for one of my respondents, it became her way of securing the fact that there could be some love interests that, um, that she could scare her boyfriend here with, basically. Uh, so, so she would talk about these you know, potential boyfriends she had in Puerto Rico, and she would talk to them on the phone once in a while, and she would travel to Puerto Rico, and that really scared this boyfriend. You know? So, um, <laughs> not enough. Not enough. I, it, you know, it was still, it was interesting how she used this, you know. But, uh, but so there was all kinds of um, ways of how they used transnational networks. Uh, one thing that I forgot to say that I'll go back to that I'll uh, sometimes um, I had one woman, Dominican woman, whose brother was doing really well in the Dominican Republic, and when she became a widow. She really uh, relied on that brother to be a male, a male role model for her children. And so the uh, interaction, transnationally speaking, became much stronger for that time during that. So that's another function of transnational ties. Oh, hold on. She wanted to. Go ahead. It didn't matter. Um, if they were traumatized, basically. Uh, what I saw in, in the women that were, you know, for a while I was like, why are they, why are they getting ahead? You know, why, what is it about them that's getting them ahead? And I found out that the first generation that was getting ahead had a very uh, active frame, uh, which said, that was based on a narrative. And the narrative was, uh, we came, we struggled to come to this country in order for, to make our life better and the life of our children better. Uh, the second generation, the same thing. It was my parents struggled really hard to come here to have a better life. And, and that was present in all of the women who were getting ahead. I mean, they could talk about that. Um, that wasn't necessarily present with the women who were traumatized. It's almost as the trauma had taken that away from them. So they, they didn't have that narrative. They didn't have that, uh, that frame. And, uh, and their sense of agency was much less than the sense of agency of the other immigrant women. So I think that uh, what I found basically was trauma. And trauma had to do with uh, gender and, and uh, domestic-based violence. Does that answer it? Um, I was amazed to the extent that n none of these parents, except for Camila, okay, Camila knew what the, the options were. Like she, uh, to this, she's one of my Facebook friends, <laughs> and her daughter just got into one of these charter school academies. I mean, she knows. She she had a good understanding of what were options in the school system. The majority of the parents didn't. They had no. They didn't even know that there were options. I mean, they just were, there was a real lack of information about uh, the different schools and the possibilities that existed. Um, so that's one area that I think it's missing. You know, I mean, somehow uh, the school system has to be more instrumental in getting this information to parents. And it may be, in, it may have to be in another language. <laughs> I mean, I, they, they, they just have to get this kind of information. They don't have it. They don't, they just, that's a big void. So for them, uh, public school is really something out of their control, and they have no control over it. Um, so that's one thing. The other is, um, you know, um, the kids, most of the kids in all of these families came home and ate the food that the mothers made. And they didn't like the food in the schools. <laughs> and, um, and this, I think, uh, was good because um, I think it helps with health disparities. Um, and the mothers were very proud of the fact that the kids were coming home and eating the food because they didn't like the food in the school. Um, I, I don't know that I would change that necessarily. <laughs> you know, I don't know 
uh, whether that's a problem or not. I think it does help families to maintain some, uh, to reinforce their immigrant identity and ethnic identity. Um, I think that what I would say is uh, just increasing the kind of information. Uh, I think a lot of these parents that come from uh, Latin America conceptualize of school as being, um, of having responsibility for schooling, and they don't necessarily see them as being, uh, having a particular role in making that happen. You know, in, in most communities in Latin America, whatever, the school is supreme. You know, whoever, what the teacher says, that's it. You know, what the director of the, of the school says, that's it. You're not, there isn't like a give and take between parents. It's not like you have a parent association who comes and, uh, and tries to put checks and balances on the teachers. There's none of that. There's no, there's no uh, activity. You know, it, the school is seen as, uh, as having the authority and the, and the uh, capacity to educate kids. So it's very hard to get these uh, parents to think of themselves as active agents in the school system. It's just, it's very hard, you know. So um, I think that I have loads of, there's loads of reasons why they're not, you know. I think that the, the public school system has to do uh, much better in trying to um, educate parents about what options they have and what role they can play as parents. I don't know if that's helpful. No, it definitely is helpful. I think it makes a lot of big difference. And the one, um, the one way that my school, when I was in elementary school, kind of got the information from my parents was giving it to me to take home. I was the youngest kid in my home. So, so, you know, so it shouldn't, it shouldn't count on you. It shouldn't have been you, you know. I'm not sure how else you do it, but, you know, maybe, you know, maybe go to the person's you know, home, you know. I mean, th there has to be a, a more emphasis placed on that and not making the child be responsible for it. So. Any other questions? Okay. Um, it was interesting in South Boston. Um, th this was interesting. Um, loads of people in public housing have mental health problems. Okay, and it's you know you you, you have structural violence happening in their lives every day. Uh, you also have loads of uh, neighborhood violence, and you may have some interpersonal violence going on. So there's loads of reasons why there's mental health problems among uh, concentrated. Uh, area, people that live in concentrated areas of poverty. So uh, it's really imperative that, there's, that there be more options for mental health treatment in these, in these conditions. Um, I was like really struck by the fact that Maverick Gardens had a mental health program. And I, I couldn't believe it. It was like, this is unbelievable because none of the public housing developments have this. So. Um, I was so happy, you know, I'm thinking, oh my God, this, they have a mental health program. So I went to interview them. And, um, you know, I asked them, they were, you know, licensed psychologists and social workers that were working in this program. And they were seeing people from the public housing development. But I asked them, so how many, uh, how many Latin immigrants do you see? And they didn't see any because none of them spoke Spanish. <laughs> So it was totally useless to the immigrant community, um, which was a real letdown. You know, I mean, I, I thought for sure this is exactly what they need, and it just wasn't available. In um, in South Boston, um, there was uh, the 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 employment advocate because the ta the tenant task force was so much more viable. The em uh, employment uh, activist and the director of the programs were both bilingual people. So, uh, and one of them was actually uh, a Dominican woman herself who lived in another public housing development uh, who had this job in, uh, in South Boston. She later on ran, uh, she graduated from Emerson College and she ran for, uh, as a representative in East Boston. So she's another one that's getting ahead. <laughs> Uh, but she, she, um, uh, she was able to, uh, because she was also culturally 
she was bicultural as well as bilingual. She was able to uh, work very well with the, uh, and get a lot of, um, get the population to trust her so that, and between her and Sister Madeline, Madalena, there was a lot of trust in, in service providers. So when, when this woman um, told uh, this other woman who was very traumatized from, from domestic violence uh, about a treatment she could receive in Dorchester, right on the other side, right by in Dorchester basically at uh, Guide Your Gibson, which is a community health clinic in Dorchester, very close to South Boston. She, she took it and she was able to go there and get it. Um, Guide Your Gibson also offered bilingual bicultural providers. So th it, it, there, there were ways, mechanisms for getting women into that situation. Uh, which wasn't the case in, in East Boston. Um, sometimes people are traumatized and they don't know it. You know, and I think that that's, uh, it manifests in the way that they deal with people and with outsiders, but they don't know that they're traumatized. They, nobody has, nobody has uh, said, oh, you know, you're acting, you know, why are you so nasty? You know, it's not, be, you know, they're saying you're nasty, but they're not saying, you know, maybe you're traumatized. And one of the ways that I saw that trauma was manifest, it wasn't this very antagonistic, angry um, posture, uh, which really turns service providers totally off, you know? So, um, you know, there's a need for, for service providers to be conscious of that when they're dealing with poor communities. Uh, Trauma and distress may show up as anger. You know, it doesn't necessarily show up as sadness. And I think that that's uh, um, another component of, of how you can get at, these, uh, at this situation, at this particular issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure, I mean, um, you know, I've been dealing with networks for a long time now, and um, you know, networks can make you or break you. You know, I mean, they. they um, uh, I think that uh, context matters from the perspective for immigrants, from the perspective that if you're among other immigrants like you, uh, you have access to other immigrants who are also self-propelling agents, so that you get some social modeling, right? I saw this over and over again, like a, a woman would be uh, hitting a barrier, you know, and she'd be like thinking about letting, you know, stopping, or she would just be having problems in a particular situation. And before you know it, she had met some other girl just like her, some other woman just like her, who was also, you know, high, very uh, motivated, who would show her how to follow through, you know? So if you have an abundance of immigrants in a situation and I think that most immigrants have a, this kind of self-propelling agency. After all, they, you know, struggled very, under very difficult situations to come to another country. Okay, that in itself demonstrates a tremendous drive, you know. So if you, you know, I think if you have a community of immigrants who are getting ahead, you can have the social modeling that helps to get ahead, and you can also have uh, access to the networks that help you get ahead. Um, if you're in a community like the, the immigrant community in East Boston, which was really depleted of services and uh, had such high levels of uh, trauma in, involved, then you're not going to do well in that community. It's going to be very hard for you because you're not seeing other people that can social mo socially model for you. You're seeing people who are in a, in a difficult situation the same way as you. So I think that uh, this issue of uh, concentration of immigrants that are healthy, <laughs> for lack of a, another word, um, it's bound to offer you the opportunities to get ahead. Uh, they bring a different 
a different perspective or different light to your situation? Okay, um, there's a whole bunch of things in what you just said, okay? But the first one that I want to talk about is this as uh, aspect of concentration. There was no, there was concentration of Latin immigrants, but they came from all kinds of places, okay? So there was heterogeneity within the immigrant community that I think in a way um, uh, doesn't allow for those type of dynamics to happen so readily, okay? Uh, if you have homogeneity in the immigrant community, then you have m many more of those issues that, that you're talking about. But I think a lot of it also has to do with the country of origin and under what conditions you came to this country. Um, so I think that that matters an awful lot as well. Uh, I think one thing that I think was helpful for the community that I was, that I followed was the fact that they were in a very heterogeneous community. So uh, Josefa, for example, who had like a super rich network of support, um, she had, she didn't have any other Hondurans except for her sister in her network. The rest of the women were all, first, she did choose first generation immigrant women because she thought second generation, they were already losing their homemaking capacity, you know. So uh, she really uh, uh, surrounded herself with first generation immigrant women. But they were first generation from everywhere, you know. So I, I think that's, uh, if you can think in terms of homogeneity versus heterogeneity, I think we can uh, get at some of these dynamics and why s some dynamics may develop where in other places they don't. I don't know if that was a sufficient answer because <laughs> you gave a lot of information. It's tremendously consequential. Um, I saw, I basically saw domestic and, uh, I mean, I saw gender-based violence as uh, having an impact and really stagnating at least three generations in a family. Um, if you, um, you know, the typical pattern is, you know, you grow up in a situation where your, um, your father is abusing the mom, right? So you grow up in a situation where, uh, the, the abuse can be arbitrary or it can be, you can find a cause and effect to it. But if it's arbitrary, and a lot of times it's, a, the, it's arbitrary because of mental illness and or uh, substance abuse. If the, if, the, if the abuse is arbitrary, then that has much graver consequences than if there's a cause and effect. And the reason I'm saying that is that kids growing up in that environment are really uh, don't have a concept of uh, time orientation away from the present. They can't plan for the future because they don't know what is going to happen when dad comes home. So because of that, they don't ever develop uh, uh, a future thinking mechanism. So they never get anywhere because of that. You know, they're stuck in today and what's happening today. Um, the other thing that that does is that it really reinforces a locus of control that's external to you. And if your locus of control is really external to you, you're really subjected to what happens externally and not what you can do about it. So because so much externally was happening to them, they really focus on, uh, they don't have a, an internal locus of control. And I see that this issue of external locus of control and lack of future orientation is havoc for families because uh, these dynamics are transferred one, from one generation to another. Uh, usually what happened is that uh, you grew up like that and then you basically left home very early uh, to get away from that kind of violence. You ended up with a, a man that was just like dad because that's all you know. Uh, then you're abused yourself. You end up, uh, that curtails your, your schooling and it curtails your parenting capacity. You have kids. Um, those kids, you're transferring all of these dynamics onto your kids. Uh, and then you see the kids having, um, you know, problems uh, in kindergarten, you know. So, and, and these have to do with health as well as, you know, just lack of preparation to be in kindergarten. So it has vast consequences, and I saw that very clearly in these families uh, because of the longitudinal component of the ethnography. Um, why men uh, do this? <laughs> That's a, another question altogether, but it has a lot to do with the fact that men don't see value in another component of their lives. If they're not being gratified 
by uh, a good job or a good, uh, good prospect for maintaining their family, they're going to take it out on their wives. I mean, it's really, you, you know, their gender dynamics and how people deal with these things. And men take it out on others while women tend to take it in and become depressed, you know, and, 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 and do things within. And I think that that really uh, runs havoc with, uh, 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 with families. But, and, and, and it has, happens a lot to minority men more than, I mean, I think it happens to anybody, right? But I think it happens in, uh, to minority men uh, more so because of their tenuous relationship with the labor market. Um, the other component that adds to domestic violence within immigrant uh, families is the fact that a lot of times women get more opportunities than men. And that has to do with the type of jobs that are out there, the, the feminization of particular industries, but also, um, from a race relations perspective, women are less threatening than men. You know, so a lot of times the uh, women get more opportunities. And a lot of my second generation, the women that I followed that were second generation, they were really having a hard time finding men because uh, they were socially mobile and it was hard for them to to uh, find uh, men that were also socially mobile with them. And part of that was healthy of their part, because if they engage with those men, those men could potentially lead to violence. So this is, this is uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's difficult. So it, and it has tremendous consequences. Does that answer your question? <laughs> OK, any more? Any other, any other comments or questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I get this. Thank you. That was very <laughs>